This, um, in this week's church service theme is it's such a great theme. Getting on with God's work. It is such a powerful and important theme. And it's something that we really need to be reminded of on a regular basis. We really do. Um, you know, the, the message could be taken in different directions. It's amazing how when you have one scripture, you can get so many different messages out of that. Today, I feel God leading me to talk about one specific um, part of that, which I'm not going to give just yet. I'm going to introduce it slowly. But we live, we live in a world that is so full of distractions. And we live in a world where we've got an enemy who loves being the great spiritual distractor, right? That's, that's, he loves to be that role. So today I start with a question for you. As a true believing Christian, a true believing Christian, one who has truly given them their lives to, to Christ, not someone in, in name only, or right, seat warmer as they say, but someone who really is, 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 Jesus is their personal Lord and Savior. What do you think is Satan's biggest goal for that person? What is Satan's biggest goal for us? If I took a random poll, we'd be online or on the street or whatever. You know, you, even non-believers would probably be aware that, you know, if they disagree, they would probably be aware that Satan's biggest goal is to destroy us. Right? And that's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. He wants to destroy us because he hates us. And why does he hate us? He hates all of humanity. Simply for the fact that God created you. Just for the fact that you exist, he hates you. And so, <clears throat> he wants to destroy us. But the question I have beyond that is, how does he want to destroy us? What is it exactly, how exactly does that work? Well, based on what we know about Satan and his, you know, his minions, or his flock of fools, as I'll call them, I believe that he has, I'm gonna use, use, use an example today. I, I believe that Satan has a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is for every human being that's ever been created, we've been tried it on Jesus. His goal in plan A is to steal our salvation. That's his goal. That's his number one goal, his biggest goal of all. However, there's a certain group of people that you may be familiar with that this plan absolutely will not work because it cannot work. And of course, I'm going to let Jesus tell us who that is. I'm going to let Jesus back that up. In John 10, 27 to 31, Jesus is quoted as saying here, my sheep, so there's the answer, my sheep, who are his sheep? His followers, his believers. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Ah, it's a beautiful promise coming up. And they shall never perish. No one. I can't shout that loud enough. I don't want to disturb people in another room. <laughs> no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one, notice something there, right? Can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Now, did you notice? I kind of pointed it out. No one is mentioned twice here. In the Bible, when words or sentences or phrases are mentioned twice, you know what that means? It means pay attention. <laughs> this is important stuff here. So, way of getting our attention. It's kind of like an exclamation point that at the end of a sentence, you ever, you ever write something passionately, right? You put an exclamation point. And if you're really passionate, you'd like put two or three, right? <laughs> it's not grammatically correct. Who cares? It really presses that point, right? Here's the point. For every person who has sincerely received Jesus, and I, and I qualify that statement, sincerely received Jesus as Lord and personal Savior, we are assured eternal protection. And no matter what this life brings, that fact should give us eternal comfort, no matter what this life brings. But as I said, there's still plan B. So plan A doesn't work on Christians. Because it can't work. Jesus' own words. But he's got a plan B. And we are still very much on Satan's radar. In some ways, all the more on Satan's radar. Unfortunately, when a person receives salvation, Satan doesn't just give up and slither away like the little slimy snake that he is. He presses in. And unfortunately, his plan B 
has proven to be very successful throughout history. That's the sad part. But it doesn't have to be successful. So here's plan B. Since Satan can't take our salvation away, no one will take, him, take us out of his hands, or out of Jesus' hands as his Father. Instead, he does everything he can, everything he can, to get us to be just as spiritually ineffective as possible. That's plan B. So, in, in example, put another way. If you can't take out the messenger, try to at least hinder the message from going out to the recipient. Good point. You and I are the messengers. Now, Satan is so deluded, he thinks that taking out us or trying to harm us is going to somehow actually block God's word from going to the recipient. He's deluded. Because we know that's not true. In other words, if God gives us a message of love or of hope and peace for somebody, and we choose not to participate in that, it's not like God's going to say to that person, sorry, dude, you're lost, they messed up. Obviously, God finds a way to come to that person, obviously. But what happens is we miss the opportunity to be a part of that amazing process. Now, we're going to take a look at how Satan enacts, how, how, how he puts into, into action his plan B. There's several ways that Satan uses to distract. That's, that's, what, that's what his plan B is all about, is distract us in life from doing what God wants us to do and sharing hope in Christ. So there's several examples. I have four just to quickly show you. Um, number one, he tries to make us believe that we're just too busy in life to get involved in sharing Jesus. So let someone else do that. Number two, he tries to make us believe that we're just too old to get involved. So let somebody else do it. Number three, he tries to make us believe that we're just not educated enough. So let somebody else do it. Or number four, and I've actually heard this one, as you'll, as you'll understand why in a second, he tries to whisper into our ears, this isn't your job. That's why pastors get paid. Let them do it. No, that's not, it's not about pay. It's not why pastors are pastors, salary or non-salary. Pastors are pastors to encourage, to equip, to motivate, right? To be a leader that supports, not shoves, not drags, walks with. That's our job. To help other people to reach the potential, to walk alongside that God has for them, for all of us. That's our job. Throughout time, these have all been very effective lives. People have back down from doing what God wants them to do. And any of them, all of them, can distract us from the theme today, getting on with God's work. They can all distract us. But from what I've personal experienced in my own life, that's a little candid openness there, in my past, and from what I've also seen in other people, it seems to me, I believe, that Satan's number one tactic and trying to block our effectiveness of for sharing Christ is not one of the four I just listed, but it's something else. That's our plan B for today. Another distraction altogether, and that's to invoke in us a fear of sharing. He loves to create a fear of sharing. So again, this week's service theme, getting on with God's word, has encouraged me to give you the following title for today. Faith over fear to get on with God's work. So it's faith over fear, I put a little comma, to get on with God's work. Webster's Dictionary, which I'm sure you're well familiar with, defines fear as anxiety and agitation caused by the presence of danger, evil, or pain, a feeling of uneasiness or apprehension. You ever had that in your life? <laughs> If you have not experienced that in your life, I really want to talk to you afterward because I want to know what your secret is. The thing about fear is, though, it can be so incredibly intense, as we know, that it can become emotionally crippling. It can be devastating. It becomes a mental health issue when it becomes debilitating into our lives. It knocks us down with depression issues and such. And it's unfortunately not uncommon. But it's not something to be ashamed of either. And that's the problem. Some people would feel like, oh, I have so much shame. Well, see, that's Satan. We're trying to push that shame onto people for having those feelings of depression. And that in itself is demonic. 
Today our world has no shortage of different types of fears. It's interesting to me and it's sad that there are so many ways that we can suffer with fear. That the world of psychology, and I've shared with you in the past, I was a counselor for 16 years working in the mental health field and the addiction field. And so I've seen and had so many clients who've, who've suffered with, and usually the, the, the main problem wasn't the addiction. I mean, in 90 plus percent of the cases, it was the addiction itself, it was underlying causes. And the majority of the time of that, it was depression, anxiety, things like that. So there's so many different forms of depression, right? That the world of psychology has actually categorized them into what we call phobias. That's what fear is, a phobia. And it's interesting, but they're actually officially spoken, officially, over 500 different types of phobias, officially. There are some that aren't listed, but I want to give you a sampling just so you know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to very quickly share 16 officially recognized phobias of you. Now, I will tell you that there is some of them have a little bit of humor behind them, but I want to, be, I want to make a disclaimer. This is very important. I am in no way making fun of people. I want to be very, very clear on that. I'm very sensitive to people that have phobias and issues. So there's no, this is not intended to make fun of everybody, anybody at all. It's just to show how absolutely huge and how widespread fear really goes. How Satan uses this and manipulates and twists in their lives. So there's no fun being made of anybody, okay, whatsoever. Here goes. Acrophobia, fear of heights. Probably you may have heard that one. Technophobia, fear of technology. Uh, I would say if I'm not close to that, that being diagnosable, I am. I'm, 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 I'm close. <laughs> Pyrophobia, fear of fire. Abeluthophobia, fear of bathing. Gammophobia, fear of marriage. I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> not you. I'm 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> Pentrophobia, fear <laughs> of your mother-in-law. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, moving on. Um, yeah, really. <laughs> Chatophobia, Chatophobia, C H A E T O phobia. Chatophobia is fear of hair. And I was thinking as I was writing that some of us have more to be or less to be married than others. <laughs> Starting to resemble that. Fat. Phalacrophobia, fear of becoming bald. Sclerophobia, fear of bald men. <laughs> Mr. Clean, Mr. Sorry. <laughs> and here's two that most of us would never have thought, you didn't even think about them. Again, these aren't just something somebody made up in a college classroom. These are officially recognized Ameri uh, American Psychological Association, APA, officially recognized. <sighs> It's, it's hard pronouncing them. Arar abuthophobia, fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. That's how you sound if you have peanut butter sticking. It's actually a recognized fear. And antidinophobia, fear of being watched by a duck. Now, we just went, we passed ducks coming off the freeway, and I thought about that. And I thought, yeah, that is a little creepy if you think about the duck just staring at you. That's, that's, I, I was going to joke and say, it can make you all feel like you're going to look quackers. Sorry, that's not. Quackers, I'm sorry. Come on, it's a dad joke. <laughs> I have three religion related phobias for you. Uh, ecclesiophobia, which is fear of church buildings. Uh, satanophobia, which is fear of Satan. And I want to mention, I want to take that for a second before on that one. Fear of Satan. Hmm. I'm not surprised that one's worked into our society. Um, it, Satan wants us to think that we have a reason to be afraid of him. <laughs> Can we be real clear? And we all know this, right? I, 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 I feel a compelling to share this. We have the ultimate weapon that is a name. It's the name of Jesus. Amen. To invoke the name of Jesus, he must immediately leave. We got to remember, Satan wants us to take opposite. Satan is under our feet. We are not under his. Ever. So satanophobia, uh, to me, that's like the number one on, on, on the hit list. He wants us to, to be afraid of him. And finally, homophobia, fear of sermons. And yes, that is real. Um, I think that it's a fear that the speaker is never going to hush up and sit down. I will, and I'm trying to be cautious of our time. Finally, 
two I find the most interesting just because they're so ironic. Bear with me on this one. Yepo, Poto, Tamen, Stroso, S, Quint, Elia, Phobia. That's a real word. Look, you couldn't actually Google it. Good luck trying, but you can Google it. 36 letters long. Anyone take a quick guess of what that is? Kevin? Fear of long words. That's it. A 36 letter word, fear of long words. That's ironic. And lastly, phobophobia. Fear of phobias. <laughs> Oh, no, come on. There's so much fear that they break this all down. It's crazy. It's really, really not healthy. Anyway, I want to get back to the, to the, to the spiritual side of this, but I really want to point that out. Again, I mean, no, no intention of being funny by anybody with that. As I said, fear can be crippling. There's so much fear crippling. And that's exactly what Satan's banking at. He wants to cripple us, and he craves us to be spiritually disabled. That's his goal. He wants to make the spiritually disabled. For the rest of today's message, we're going to focus on a specific phobia, though, that's not mentioned in the list because it doesn't actually exist. Interestingly, it doesn't exist. American Psychological Association wouldn't recognize it, and I'm talking about Satan's plan B, the very real and the very debilitating fear or phobia of sharing Jesus with the world. Not surprising that satanophobia, fear of Satan is there, but that, you know, sharing Jesus, well, that's not even recognized. But that's a very real fear. Philippians 5, 6 to 11, that is our official uh, main scripture portion for today. <clears throat> I'm only pulling out a couple things of it, but that's, that's our section. So I'll read, this, read those to you. Here we see Paul directly telling the reader <clears throat> what to do with anxiety or with our fears. 1 Peter 5, 6 to 11 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same type of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. In other words, hang in there. God's got you, right? That's the whole crux of, the, of this section. But what's interesting in this here, the fourth portion, is that right before Paul mentions Satan prowling around and looking for someone to devour, right? He says, and they say, a very important statement, cast all of our anxiety on him, on the God. So let's take care of that first. So then you can watch out. Because if, if you haven't cast the anxiety, you're vulnerable to being devoured. That's the point. The question is, how do we do that? How do you actually cast your anxiety on God? It's just a matter of willing it away, some form of hypnosis. Of course not, right? That's ridiculous. The way that Paul tells us, he, he just told us, is he starts off with humble yourself. So how do you cast off your anxiety? You humble yourself. And there's a little, little core process I'm going to walk you through in a minute and show you that. So within this short passage, Paul gives us a solution to fight against fear. Number one, humble yourself, which leads to us being able to do number two, which is to cast our fears onto God. Okay? And since we're talking specifically about Satan's plan B today, again, that's you know, making us fearful or to make us you know, <clears throat> ineffective for the gospel, we're going to look at these two main points, again, humbling and casting our fears uh, from Paul in light of overcoming any fear of sharing Jesus. Okay, so that's the, the, the focus. So again, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety, all of your anxiety, onto him because he cares for you. So even being able to confidently, right, and fully give our fears over to, over to God, it all begins with a genuinely humble heart. It all starts there. Our relationship with God, giving our fears to God, it all starts with humility. Why? Because what's the opposite of humility? False pride, right? Boastfulness, self, right? It's all about self. Humility before God. That's why God puts such emphasis on humility all throughout his word, actually. 
And the thing that genu- the, the, um, the thing about a genuinely humble heart for God, right, is that it's not just some action. It's not just some emotion. You, you, in the moment, okay, I'll be humble now because I'm, I'm you know, humble my heart, God, I'm coming before you. No, it's more than that. It's not just some flip, something you flip on you know, and off the light switch. A humble heart must go through a process. We become humble. You don't just act humble, you become humble before God. And that happens in two steps. Step number one, to be fully and genuinely humble before God. It requires surrendering ourselves fully to God. So to be humble before God, you have to be surrendered to God. Because if we try to hang on to some false sense of personal control, right, not surrendered, in other words, in reality, we're only showing false humility. If we're not going to truly surrender our lives to God, we're being fake. And it's false humility. Lord, I'm in your presence. Oh, hang over my head. That's garbage. Humility requires surrender. If we don't, God will see right through it. Then step number two, to surrender ourselves fully requires that we deeply trust God. I mean, you don't surrender yourself to something if you don't trust them, right? You need to trust God. And I know it's easy to say, oh, God is God, of course I trust him. And and, and I hope that it's true, it's great. If you do, it's wonderful. We, We should all, we need to be trusting him. But that's also a process. Just because we know we should trust God, and just we know that we can trust him, you can know that you should trust him, you can know that you you can trust him, the question is, do we trust him? Well, it'll show up in our actions if we don't, fully. And Satan likes to whisper in our ears and make us, oh yeah, those little lies, I'm not trusting, not even trusting God. We still have to personally learn to deeply trust God. And there's no other way for that to happen. There's no other way in the universe for you to learn to trust God and to experience time in his presence than to grow with him in personal relationship with him over time. So this is a process of him. I'm giving you a lot of words right now. I'm going to break it down in a minute. And then as we learn to trust God more, the more we're able to release our fears. And the, and the more we release our fears, the better able we're able to step out in faith. When the Holy Spirit says, go here, do this, say that. So it's a process. I'm, I'm going I'm to show you. Here's my point in all of this, though. If we find ourselves struggling, and I really want to get at this point, to not humbly do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do, that still small voice give me a direction. And if we resist that, maybe we have some fear of that. Whatever that is. We have fear or concern. It's not that we're being evil and rebellious people. The Satan wants you to think that. First, he wants to trick you to not do what he wants you, what God wants you to do. Don't listen to that. Then once you don't do it, he says, you're rebellious. Look at you, you're disgusting. He's a liar. He's a trickster, then a liar. The real problem is, it's likely that basically we're just dealing with a humility issue. That's what it really boils down to. And here's the awesome news. Here's the awesome news to help us get back into getting on with God's work. There's a solution, and it's not hard. It's all about one thing. It all goes goes back to more time in God's presence. It's all all, what it's about. Why do you think we're told pray without ceasing? with us. That means you don't take a breath, don't eat, don't sleep. Of course not. It means being in a mindful set of a constant connection with God. That's the whole point. More time in God's presence to develop more trust. More trust, here's the fear, not breaking this all down, but I'm sharing with you. More trust naturally drives us to want to surrender more to God. And the more we surrender, the more we're humble before God. The more humility we have, the more we're able to uh, able to confidently give our fears to God. And then the more that takes place, the more our fears are given over, the more confidently we're able to respond to the Holy Spirit when he gives us assignments. So it's a whole step process. I want you to picture for a second as I really actually get close to wrapping up, how awesome it is to be so sensitive to the voice of God. How incredible is that? Spoken in different ways, or acknowledged through somebody else, something you read. There's lots of ways God talks to us. That you can just be going about your daily business, right? Walking in everyday life, you know, 
And suddenly you hear God saying, and here's a great example when I say that. What is that? What do you mean that? What do you call it? Holy Spirit tells you. Well, here, here's an example. Go up to that person over there and offer prayer. <gasps> They're a stranger. They'll think I'm weird. How awesome would it be beyond that? Not only that, to hear that, but also to be fully assured, fully surrendered, fully trusting God that all fear is gone. And you're able to say to God with full confidence, even excitement, all right, God, yes, Lord, point the way. Tell me what to say. Let's do this. Here's the truth, though, with that scenario. It is absolutely, 100%, completely possible for you to experience this. It is 100% possible. It is a choice. It is a choice. If you haven't had that type of experience before and you want that, or at least it's, you're curious about it, ask God for it. We have not because we ask not. Lord, if you want to make me bold, feel free, I'm ready. That's not it. That's, that's not it. Hit target. Target is, Lord, I want more of you. I want to be bold, bold for you. I want to see your kingdom advance. Do everything that you want to do. I receive it all. That's the target. That's the goal. Humbly spend time in his presence. See faith and boldness over the demonic fear of lies. The lies of fear, excuse me, the back, over the demonic lie of fears. Because that's all fear is. God commands us in his word, do not fear. He didn't say, you should probably live in fear of your life. That would be good for you. He didn't say that. He says, do not fear. That's a command. Do not fear because you don't have to. We can be spiritually bold. We can be. To get on with God's word. In closing, I have three very quick recommendations for helping to overcome any fear of personally sharing Christ. I found these, I, I kind of lose, um, expanded, but I found these specific ones from the book called The Jesus Project, and I think they're really excellent. So many credit to The Jesus Project. Um, number one, never forget that love is always greater than all fear. You want to overcome fear? Don't forget that. Love is greater than fear. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Important point there. The one who suffers is not made perfect in love. So here John is specifically linking fear and punishment, right? What does that mean? When we, when we share our faith with people, sometimes we get fearful that we're going to be in trouble, that we're going to offend other people. And as a result, we're going to be punished somehow. For example, maybe someone will reject us. That's punishment. Maybe someone will think less of us. Ugh, Christians do. That's a, a, a form of punishment. Or maybe they'll even blow up at us. How dare you? How dare you? Do you ever think for a second that just maybe, even if when you do that, and even if someone does blow it, it, but the key is being, you know, Holy Spirit led. That's, that's the key, right? Holy Spirit led. Right? So then you follow through and something blows up. Was that a waste of time? If God directed you to do that, guess what happened? The seeds have been planted. He'll, he'll, he'll deal with that later. Just because we get a, you know, we, we don't get a, oh, yes, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus right now. Let's pray together. Lord, again. That may never happen. Does a gardener in a community, you know what a community gardener garden is? You, you plant all that and people come and do the thing again. Does, does, does a person who plant the seed always, always the one who thinks to, in a harvest? No. Right? Perfect love overcomes any of those fears because it means putting someone else's needs for Jesus above our own fears of rejection. It's an important statement. Number two, quickly, trust Holy Spirit. John 12, verses 11 through 12 says, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at what time what you should say at that time what you should say also john 14 26 is similar the advocate the holy spirit from the father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you that's the point so i wonder if you repeat that one as well remind you of everything i've said to you he brings it to remembrance although there's a key there i mean just throw this thing this is really important bringing something to remembrance means you got in there in the first place so be in god's word so you know we, we can't expect you know in other words Make sure we're, we're, we're reading, we're learning, we're growing. 
the super operator. Fear of failure is a very crippling lie that Satan loves to whisper in our ears. He makes excuses like, just study more. Maybe someday you'll be ready. That's garbage. Do you know when the right time to respond to the Holy Spirit is? It's when the Holy Spirit speaks. It's not like God's asking most of us to give a two-hour lecture on a topic of something like the theological implications of the 21st century of Jesus' hypostatic nature between Father and or between Holy God and Holy Man. What did I just say? <laughs> He's not asking us to give a two-hour lecture on that. That was a real thing, though. I didn't have to say just. <laughs> He's asking us to trust Holy Spirit and to do what he says. And then to give glory and honor to Jesus. Make sure that's important. God says, I want you to bless that person with the money you're well. Oh, 20 bucks, here you go. God, you know, like, here's the point. If you say, you know what? Here's $20. Have a good day. Have you just given glory to God? No. God put it on my heart to give you this money. This is not mine. This is God's to you. Have a wonderful day. Did I just give glory to God? Yeah. Yes. What's the difference? It's critical. Give glory to God. He will always give us the tools necessary. Find number three. When you're scared, obey anyway. Oh no, obey anyway. How many times does God wait on us? Right? He plants the thoughts, He plants the seeds. He says, do this, whoever this is, right? And we say, okay, God, but I'm still waiting. We're waiting on God's going to give it to you. Let's go. What's God waiting on us to do? Take one step forward. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Paul tells the Corinthian church, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. What does it mean to be courageous? It means step out of faith. Do it. Are you scared? Do it anyway. That's the end. That's, 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 the, that's the end point. That, that, that's, that's the whole part of purpose. The more we step out in faith, the, more, the easier it becomes. Then we ever learn to ride a bicycle. When you ride, learn to ride a bicycle or to skate or to do anything in life, did you jump on going, yes, cool, I got it. If you did, probably in about two seconds or three seconds, you were probably on the ground. And then you go, wait, that hurt. Then fear sets in. Anything new can give you a sense of fear. The more we do it, the easier it becomes. Fear over faith gets to help us to get on with God's work. That's why I gave that title today. If we, I'm, I'm finishing up now. If we wait for our feelings of fear to go away, if we just wait in life before obeying the Holy Spirit's direction, we're likely going to miss several awesome opportunities in life. But if we step out in faith toward fear, we step out, take that one step, we're definitely going to be able to get out um, God's work. Amen? Amen. Amen? All right, we have the blessing of communion. Um, um, once again, we have opportunity. And it, it, this, this is, make sure I have my. What did I do with it? It's right. Okay, thanks. This is an awesome opportunity to be reminded of the greatest gift of all time. I love this this opportunity. I typically don't do this in Connecticut, other people do, um, but it is, is, is a wonderful opportunity. We're reminded of the perfect sacrifice. Right? Very simple. The perfect sacrifice from the perfect Lord to wash away and to forgive our imperfections. It's really that simple. It really boils down to that simple. Today we talked about faith over fear. And do you know that taking communion together actually is a reminder of faith over fear? It is. Let me explain to you. Remember, I said this world is absolutely filled with fear. I gave that whole list, of course, so much so that you know there's, there's all these categories. Every time we take communion together, it's a beautiful reminder that we choose Jesus. And choosing Jesus is not only about spiritual life or spiritual death. Choosing Jesus is about spiritual boldness over living in fear. So every time we take this, the blood, it represents the blood in the body of Christ, the broken body. It's a reminder that fear no longer has, has a right in our lives. Because Jesus, specifically, Jesus led the way. He conquered all fear. Do you think he was happy going to that cross? I don't think so. But was he happy for what the cross would do? Absolutely. He overcame the fear of the cross, right? Because his focus was on you and I. So let this out and remind you that the fear of that cross was overcome, right? The broken body, the spilled blood. They did away with all fear. You no longer have to be afraid, God's word tells. Remember, it's a commandment. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. 
My wife, beautiful wife, is going to come up front, and she is going to pray a blessing for us over both of you. And then we'll take her after. Father, loving Father, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today's message. Thank you for your mercy, for your compassion on us. Father, we know that the cross, your death on the cross separates us from sin and communes us with you. Father, in just a moment, we're going to take a representative of your shed body, your shed blood and your broken body, which reminds us that of your love. Father, we don't have to be lonely. We don't have to be afraid. You paid the price, Lord, and we're so grateful. Father, our hearts, our intentions are good and we love you and we thank you for your sacrifice. Um, thank you that we're included, that we are your children. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We'll take the bread first in your hand. This is something that I really encourage people to do. Thank you, Brenda. Take a moment and just reflect on it. Take a quick moment and just reflect on what this represents. The broken body of our Lord, as we remember. What a blessing it is that he took our place. He was broken so that we don't have to be broken eternally. The body of the Lord is our balance. And then we have the juice, which represents the blood of Jesus, of course. One drop of blood, one drop. The song right about that, I believe. Solitary. But Jesus didn't give one drop of blood. His blood was poured out, quite literally. And that is very sobering, very humbling. As we remember the blood of the Lord, they would do it in humility, with humility, with real humility, and with gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us in Jesus' name. 